Building and maintaining a backyard pond is pretty easy once you understand a few basic things. In this video I want to cover the basics of pond filtration so that everyone understands how to achieve clear water. G'day, my name is Kev. The aim of my channel is to help people build and maintain ponds without spending a fortune. If that sounds like something that interests you, feel free to subscribe and check out my website ozponds.com. I think the most important thing for anyone starting out on their pond journey is learning about filtration. How you filter the pond will be determined by the type of pond that you have or a building. For example, if you are building a small frog pond, you won't need very much, if any, additional filtration. The same if you just want a pond for growing water plants like lotus and lilies. If you want to keep fish, you'll most likely need to incorporate a filter or filters. Small hardy fish like white clouds and rice fish make great beginner fish and they don't need much filtration. Keeping larger fish like goldfish and koi in a backyard pond will require some form of filtration. For simplification purposes, there's pretty much two ways that water is filtered either by plants or by bacteria. Most pond owners will choose to incorporate both. So in a pond without larger fish, we can pretty much just rely on the plants to keep the water clean, clear and healthy. But if we want to keep larger fish or lots of fish, we really need the bacteria or more importantly, lots of bacteria. Because even the ponds with just the plants, bacteria will grow. The bacteria I'm referring to are commonly called nitrifying bacteria and they're responsible for processing the nitrogen inside the pond. You might be wondering, why is there nitrogen in the pond? Well, as plant material decomposes inside the pond or fish breathe, a form of nitrogen called ammonia is produced. Ammonia is bad for fish health and other aquatic life. Plants can use ammonia to grow and the nitrifying bacteria can convert the ammonia into a less harmful type of nitrogen called nitrate, which can also be used by the plants and isn't so bad for the fish and other aquatic animals. The bigger the fish or the more of them you have, the more ammonia the pond will produce and therefore more bacteria is needed to convert the ammonia. So how do we get these good bacteria? It's easy, they're already living all around us and will find the pond as soon as there's ammonia present. But the bacteria do need a few things to really multiply. They need surfaces to grow on and they need oxygen. In a pond with lots of plants, the bacteria are growing on all the parts of the plant that are inside the water. So the plants are not only able to consume some ammonia and nitrate directly, they also increase the amount of wet surface area inside the pond for the bacteria. Now you might be wondering, well that sounds great, why do I need a dedicated filter when the plants and the bacteria inside the pond are already this awesome filter? And it's a valid question. A pond that relies on plants and a bit of bacteria will have lots and lots of plants. Usually more than 50% of the pond is covered in plants. So this is a great option for those that want a water garden and very few fish. But if you're someone that enjoys the fish more and you want crystal clear water, or you want something that's a bit lower maintenance, you need a dedicated filter for the bacteria. So how does that look? Basically the aim of the filter game is moving water through wet surfaces that are colonized by the bacteria. There's many ways that this can be done, so let's look at a few examples. The first is a high flow system. This takes up very little room, but uses a large pump to move a lot of water over the surface area inside the filter. This filter is filled with bio balls that are providing the surface area. They're designed to maximize the amount of the area available for bacteria in a tight little package. 
This filter also has sponges that will trap sediments. You can make these types of filters yourself quite cheaply. If using these types of filters, you want to move the entire volume of the pond through the filter at least once every hour. Basically, the more circulation, the better. There's lots of different variations that you can make of a high flow filter. And then this is a bog filter. It takes up a much larger area. For goldfish, you can do a bog that is 10% of the pond size. Koi, 15 to 20%. The rock and pebble provide the surface area and the bog can be planted so that you can utilize the power of plants to aid in filtration. In a bog, water is pumped into the bottom of the filter and it flows up through the rock and the pebble. This filter has a slower flow rate in comparison to its size. These filters will usually aim to circulate the pond around every hour or less. There's lots of different ways to design a bog filter. If you're interested in bog filtration, check out my video on designing a bog filter. And you also might like my formulas PDF that's available on the website. Another type of filter is an under gravel or suction grid. This one utilizes an air pump rather than a submersible pump. It's basically a grid of pipes with holes drilled in. Pebble is placed over the pipes. Again, this is the surface area for the bacteria. An air stone is placed in a vertical pipe that extends down below the horizontal grid. As air displaces the water inside the vertical pipe, water from the grid pipes replaces it. Then the water is replaced by water that has moved down through the bed of pebble. So as you can see, in all three examples, the water is being moved through surfaces that are covered in bacteria. I personally love bogs and high flow filters. They're very easy to create and they just work every time. That makes them perfect for beginners and experts alike. The high flow filter is awesome in that it doesn't take up a lot of room and it can convert large amounts of ammonia into nitrate really quickly. And a bog filter can use up nitrate via the plants and it also has bacteria that live in low oxygen environments and they can turn the nitrogen into a gas and that gas dissipates into the atmosphere. On my dream pond, I incorporated both types of filters. I will link some of the bog filters and high flow filters that I've built for my ponds in the description and I'll also link some of the off-the-shelf filters that work for those that don't think that they're able to build one themselves. If you have enough bacteria in relation to whatever is living inside the pond, the water will stay crystal clear. If the pond goes green and the water clarity declines, it's an indication that there is not enough bacteria or too many fish in relation to the amount of bacteria. There are bacteria products that you can buy, but if you don't have enough surface area for the bacteria to continue growing, it's just a waste of money. The water might go clear for a little while, but it will soon revert back to green. And if your pond does go green, don't panic. The fish are still safe. The green is caused by microscopic algae that are growing to feed on the ammonia. These microscopic algae are doing you a favour by processing that ammonia. And the fish are living the dream, as this microscopic algae attracts all kinds of microscopic life. For the fish, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. But if you want to return the water to crystal clear, you need more filtration that provides surface area for the bacteria or you need to reduce the amount of fish or organic material that's breaking down inside the pond. Once there's enough bacteria in sustainable numbers for the amount of ammonia, the pond goes clear again. Now the algae that causes green water is very different to the stringy type of algae that grows on rocks and plants. You also might often have it grow on your waterfalls and in your streams. This type of algae tends to feed more on phosphorus. Your water can be crystal clear, 
yet you'll still have the stringy algae. I recently read that one pound of phosphorus can support 500 pounds of algae. So even a small amount of phosphorus in the pond can cause a lot of stubborn stringy algae. Anyway, I recently made a video on some of my struggles with stringy algae, so I'll link that video in the description as well. The video will give you some natural solutions and some nuclear solutions if you're at the end of your tether. I hope this video has helped give you a basic understanding of how water is filtered in a pond. I always think you should aim to over filter, that way as the fish breed or get bigger you've got plenty of surface area available should the bacteria need it. If you did find the video helpful feel free to tickle the thumbs up button and as always thanks for watching, see ya.